Hello, and welcome to today's ACAMS Web Seminar, True Cost of Compliance, Results of a 2017 Study, sponsored by LexisNexis Risk Solutions. My name is Nicole Ackerman, ACAMS Training Manager. I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items before I turn the program over to our first speaker. During the event, the presentation slides will appear on your screen. If you'd also like to download a copy of the slides, please click on the Attachments tab on your player window. Web seminars are enhanced by your participation, so we encourage you to send your questions by using the question button at any time. If you experience any audio issues during the webcast, please click on the Rate This button and follow the instructions to receive help. If that does not resolve the issue, please email support at brighttalk.com and a customer support specialist will get back to you shortly. Today's speakers are Crystal Correa and Victoria Meyer. Crystal leads LexisNexis Risk Solutions Global Anti-Money Laundering Solutions Strategy and Technology-Driven Product Development. In his role, he works with the largest financial institutions in the world. Based in London, he is responsible for managing and developing international AML and financial crime solutions, including customer and transaction screening software, world compliance data solutions for third-party risk management, as well as international identification verification solutions. Next, we have Victoria Meyer. Victoria is a director of the Swiss International Business Academy. She trained in the Forensic Services Department of KPMG London before moving on to coordinate the European Forensic Technology Practice for PricewaterhouseCoopers. After more than a decade in big four forensic practices, she now works mainly in the financial services sector and has worked with the UN, OFAC, and other government agencies on a new format for anti-terrorism sanctions information. Over the last decade, a core focus of her identity matching work has been in AML customer and transaction screenings. It's now my pleasure to turn the program over to Crystal, who will get us started on today's presentation. Crystal? Thank you, Nicole, and thank you to all of you joining us today. Today we're going to be reviewing some of the findings from the latest survey on the total cost of AML. Um, we're going to be joined by Victoria Mayer, who will be providing some in insight on what this means, particularly in the context of compliance technology. We'll aim to keep some time for questions, um, and uh, please follow the, the instructions chair just now should you have any questions along the way. The context of the survey came in the came because of the, the increasing operational and regulatory pressures on compliance departments. But I think we're all aware that um, sanctions compliance remains a very high risk and fluid activity. Over the years, the, the range and scope of sanctions has increased so that compliance departments now have more country programs to manage, for example. Uh, and also, there's a broader scope of the types of risk that are managed, um, including products. Now, in this context, um, and also that of increased um, regulatory action, we're, we're seeing that the, the need um, to respond quickly to sanctions remains a, a significant operational challenge. This comes at a time when AML regulations are also evolving. Uh, we see progressively complex regulations uh, that broaden the scope of obligation in AML screening, particularly in, in the field of politically exposed persons and other high-risk individuals. And the new EU proposals for the next um, round of the directive um, seem directionally to increase this scope. And compliance departments are, again, responding to the obligations um, which involve a, a larger amount of screening. In addition, we see a greater convergence uh, with other types of compliance activities, notably those of anti-bribery and corruption laws. And we see a number of cases in which uh, the overlap between AML and ABC is very significant. That's driving operations together. And there's a greater emphasis on protecting uh, reputation, um, uh, reputation and the compliance with um, various supply chain laws. Lastly, we see more initiatives to reduce tax evasion. Now, that may involve extending um, the definition of AML to uh, all predicate offenses uh, of money laundering, and tax crime is, is a very significant one. Several jurisdictions have introduced measures that require 
Um, they're obligated institutions to proactively monitor clients uh, for tax red flags. And we're seeing more and more governments issue FATCA type um, reporting obligations, um, which provides a, um, a greater amount of information for compliance departments to screen. So looking at the survey, what we aim to do um, in this context of more regulation, um, more effort, more work, more cost, was to look at how the total cost of AML um, is being managed across um, five countries in Europe. We wanted to get a sense from the respondents on how compliance budgets are spent, is that current level of investment sustainable, and what are the business benefits of compliance. In total, so 250 institutions responded. The majority of those came from uh, banking, but we also had a number of res uh, respondents from other regulated sectors, including insurance and asset management, and interestingly, from money service businesses. Uh, the roles of the persons that we polled were quite varied. Um, here are some of the areas of professional focus. And Overall, this gave us quite a, a broad um, sweep of opinions from different areas of a compliance system. The five countries we polled were France, the Netherlands, Germany, Switzerland, and Italy. The median number of respondents from each was 50, which is very pleasing indeed. Um, the survey um, was weighted in that the largest institutions tended to be um, based in France and Germany, with the other three jurisdictions providing uh, a proportionally greater number of smaller and mid-tier institutions. So the key findings, uh, in my perspective, w was that, um, very surprisingly, um, the respondents saw that um, the regulatory obligation um, was a business enabler. Now, previously, in other surveys that we've conducted, um, notably the similar survey on the total cost of AML we did for Asia, we saw that regulatory compliance was a primary driver of um, compliance spend. Uh, but in the five countries polled, um, that uh, the primary reason was you know, it, it's good for business. And I think that's indicative of a cultural change uh, within financial institutions. The total cost uh, in a large institution averaged um, 41.15 million euros. I'll be explaining um, the, some of the workings behind that in more detail. Perhaps not uh, surprisingly, we, we, say, we saw a number of respondents um, citing the productivity and high customer friction that AML compliance was, was causing them in, in their day-to-day -day operations. And we also saw that headcount is expected to increase in response to new regulations such as the fourth directive. But there was also a feeling that uh, this um, rise in cost, uh, particularly in headcount cost, was not going to be sustainable. So here's some detail on the top drivers of AML initiatives. And as you can see on the left-hand side, improvement of business results was the most popular response. Now, interestingly, this was cited um, most often by smaller and mid-tier institutions. Um, and uh, I think this was um, really interesting because perhaps one might have expected um, the awareness of the business benefits of compliance um, to um, be stronger in larger institutions. We also saw a high number of respondents citing reputational risk as a top driver for AML um, initiatives. Now, th this we think is associated with um, the OECD Automatic Exchange of Information initiatives and also the forthcoming open banking 
that will be delivered by the Payment Services Directive in Europe. Now, both of those initiatives provide more transparency of a financial institution's clients to other parties. And so we saw that um, as part of an AML program, um, more reputation risk screening was taking place. Victoria, you've got a lot of experience of working in or for a bank. Um, were you surprised by the level of responses for improved business results? Um, I guess I was a bit surprised when I first saw this graphic. I think it's certainly not the graphic we would have seen, say, 10 years ago in the European uh, financial services sector. Um, on one level, it makes perfect sense that improving business results is a key driver for AML initiatives, and I think that reflects the maturity of European compliance operations, where you know AML leaders are often part of the senior executive and therefore have a strategic eye on the future of the business. Um, but I guess there were two aspects that surprised me a little bit. Uh, firstly, I was surprised that it was that improving business results was such a clear leader in the list of motivations. That could maybe be because I've worked so much in Switzerland where there's a, a, a really high density of smaller, very traditional private banking institutions where AML is often still seen as a, a means of keeping the regulators off their backs. And actually, if you dig down into the results of this survey and, and look at the Swiss results, um, you can see that, that reputational regulation, regulatory risk were really the key drivers for AML in Switzerland there. So I, I think that does actually tie in with my experiences. Um, at the other end of the market, the other element that perhaps surprised me a little bit was, was the focus on business results, simply because when you go to conferences and you listen to the heads of AML in the leading financial institutions speak, profit just isn't their obvious motivation. You hear much more of an emphasis on social responsibility, talking about combating corruption and tackling human trafficking, and much more of an emphasis on things like promoting financial inclusion within the AML initiatives. So there's a sort of professional social conscience, I think, that's really developed over the last 10 years. So yes, it, it makes perfect sense to me that AML is so focused on, on driving business results, but at the same time, I think the overall picture is, is a little bit more nuanced than maybe the headlines suggest. Thanks, Victoria. In many ways, I think these results um, are the mirror of what we saw in Asia, where, as I mentioned, um, regulatory, regulatory compliance was the big driver. Um, there was also um, an awareness of the need to demonstrate to um, dollar clearers in New York, for example, that um, the correspondent banking chain was compliant at every stage. Um, we, we saw that um, compliance was really deemed to be a tool in order to secure those relationships. And lastly, we saw support for um, international expansion uh, also being a big motivation for investing when, uh, for example, a, an Asian bank was opening up new branches in Europe or the US or acquiring banks in other regions. It, it was at that point where AML um, was really playing a part um, as, uh, as, um, as a piece of business expansion. Good. So on the next slide here, we have some details of the uh, benefits um, to the business brought by uh, compliance change. And I thought it was interesting that um, the, uh, the first two columns on the left-hand side uh, both cite improvements in data as being the, the most beneficial um, consequence of the AML program. So firstly, um, that was um, improvements in the, the customer relationship management, and secondly, in identifying financial risk. So the desire for more insight um, derived from improvements in data uh, was a, a big benefit. And I think a couple of years ago, the results would have been a bit different in that um, it, there perhaps would have been more focus on shorter customer onboarding cycles or, or perhaps something uh, on STP. Uh, but now there's a growing realization that compliance can really drive um, the, re the productive um, identification of business opportunity um, through providing um, better and more accurate uh, insight.
Now, this slide, I think, was somewhat subjective, the opportunity cost of um, refused accounts. What we aimed to do here was to put a cost on customer friction. Um, how much does it cost an institution uh, when customers get frustrated with the onboarding process and walk out the door? Now, I say so this is perhaps a little subjective um, in that it's very difficult to identify which customers are abandoning the onboarding process because they're fed up of going through the onboarding process. It, it might be the case that um, some of these customers walking out the door uh, are not customers that you really want to have anyway, or it could be indicative um, of, of the effectiveness of the um, of the AML compliance program at a bank which is preventing the bad money coming in. Uh, but nevertheless, I thought 3.5% um, of opportunity uh, was quite a significant amount, and it's a number that um, we, we see coming under more scrutiny as financial institutions look to onboard uh, more customers more efficiently. This graph looks at the breakdown um, of activity by compliance type and also uh, provides some detail on how um, resource is spread between technology and uh, labor. Um, I think that the, um, the, the split between technology and labor um, at a ratio of three to one was interesting. Um, and that AML compliance management on the right-hand side here at 31% is the second biggest cost. Inevitably, I think that's led to banks trying to reduce cost um, by reducing uh, management costs. Now, perhaps there's, there's, um, that's being done by introducing uh, more efficient technology or more types of technology, such as robotic process automation, machine learning, um, AI, those types of things. So we are seeing a clear trend to readjusting those ratios towards um, technology, but there's also um, a potential risk if the core skills needed to manage um, these technologies or new initiatives um, also goes out the door too. Um, Victoria, how do you see the relationship between human and uh, tech resources changing? Uh, do you think banks are uh, are using technology in the right way to manage these costs? Uh, well, those are two very interesting questions. Perhaps if I, I look at them separately, um, looking at the relationship between the, the technology costs and the, and the human costs, I think it's clear that the AML profession can't continue to make effectiveness gains without switching up that balance between human and technology resource costs. That said, I would be the last person to suggest that we can replace experience and skilled decision-making with new develops in, developments in technology. I don't think that's anything that could realistically happen anytime soon. I think what is likely to happen is that technology will be used mostly, firstly, to streamline working processes, and secondly, to automate a lot of the significant data shuffling work that happens in compliance departments at the moment, where staff have to consolidate uh, information and data from a variety of disparate sources trying to get a full picture of the alert that they're investigating. As well as the balance shifting, I think we'll also need to see a change in the way compliance staff relate to the technology tools that they're working with, and that's both at the operational level and the strategic level. At the operational level, even with the RegTech precursors like identity screening and transaction monitoring tools, there's often still a disconnect between the working of the tools and the way that they're integrated into processes that we see all the time when we're trying to improve the effectiveness in banks. Just as an example, over the last few years, we've seen many more sophisticated name screening tools that can now recognize things like transcription variants of Arabic or Russian names and deal with the naming conventions that are common across Latin America uh, and different you know, variations in names that can lead to alerts. But the output is often outsourced to lower level operational staff who don't have that linguistic understanding to see why a name match was produced. And they're often dismissing perfectly valid name matches on the basis that, well, they look totally different to me. 
And that gap needs to be bridged either with more linguistic training for alert handlers or with system upgrades that provide notes to the alert handlers on the linguistics behind the alert to stop them dismissing alerts just because they don't really look the same to them. And that kind of disconnect is seen in many AML processes currently, and we need to kind of close that gap. At the strategic level, that deeper understanding of what technology is doing needs to follow on up through the organization to those making strategic decisions. I think at the moment there's a, there's a great temptation to look at the RegTech offerings on the market and come up with a use case in the hope that you can cut your costs. And what actually needs to happen is an assessment of the issues that are hampering the effectiveness and an understanding of, of how technology can contribute to solving those issues. And that is going to require a greater level of understanding both of how the technology works and how it could work within a specific process in the bank. In terms of are they using the technology in the right way, I think I'd have to say that, that there is room for improvement, which I think everyone would be happy to hear because if this is as good as it gets, we're going to struggle to find the effectiveness improvements that we need going forward. Um, looking to the future, there's clearly a role for the more advanced RegTech tools, and they're going to be improving our process designs to um, collating uh, data more efficiently, and very significantly, they're going to be introducing a greater degree of AI and machine learning so that we have more sophistication in the level of alerts that we're generating. But there are pitfalls to introducing this new technology, and I think the two greatest that I'd just like to quickly highlight here are the, the data management and vendor selection. On the data management side, I think a lot of banks are either ignoring their legacy data quality issues or dismiss them as something that will sort themselves out over time. But that, that kind of approach really hobbles the potential of new analytical tools. It's perhaps not a, not a very sexy exercise to look at the quality and format of the data and to you know, bring it up to, to modern standards, but I think it's something that needs to be done. And I'd like to, to throw that point, particularly if there's anyone on the call today that is from a non-traditional banking organization like the telecoms firms that are branching into finance. Because a lot of the issues that the, the banks are facing today stem from the horrible data formats and data management uh, practices of the past. And these new pl payment platforms really have the opportunity now to avoid creating those problems for themselves. Uh, but we're not seeing the investments there that they need in order to prepare themselves for a future in financial services. And then lastly, I think the vendor selection process is often found wanting because while there are clear opportunities for technology to improve AML effectiveness, various consulting firms and technology vendors have all seen that movement coming and the quality of the offerings varies enormously. I'm very often called into bank that has recently invested in a new expensive tool and asked to help them configure it or to write the procedures around it, only to have to report back to them that we can't do that until we've worked with the vendor to close some fairly serious deficiencies in the product they've invested in. It's a common problem, and a lot of banks are currently locked into contracts with vendors they'd, they'd happily you know, see going out of business. So I can't stress important enough how how important enough it is to have purchasing decisions led by compliance staff with a technical background, not by staff with limited data management experience, and even not by, by technical staff who then select a tool that's rubber stamped by compliance, because that way lies any number of very costly mistakes. Thanks, Victoria. So 20 years or so ago, um, when I was working with the OFAC list, I'd have a PDF or perhaps an Excel. Um, and now today, regulators are increasingly aware of the efficiency uh, benefits and also the, um, the effectiveness gain of new technologies, um, machine learning, AI, and so on. Um, we've also heard that um, compliance departments sometimes feel that they don't have the skills to really understand either the new products that are being launched by their institutions or how to um, accurately and, um, and in confidence understand the compliance risk of fintech products. Um, what can financial institutions do to um, make sure compliance departments are skilled for this new era? Um, well, I think there's several ways that they can do that. Um, firstly, they need, they need to keep on top of the new developments. So, so look at what the different uh, bodies are putting out, new data formats for sanctions, new, new products that are coming out. And then they need to look at the, the resources, the, the staff resources that they've got, because 
what you really need is with any new tool or any new data format, you need someone in your department who is an expert in that, who really understands how it works and also can understand the way that it will impact your own processes and how the, the data formats work when compared to your own data formats. Um, so you need to and you need to look at the staff that you've got now and see are they the kind of staff that can be trained to deal with this or do we need to hire in people with perhaps a more specifically data management background because that is, is really what a lot of the, the new AML uh, trends that's where they're going is, is more effective use of the data and the intelligence. And uh, if you don't have the staff that can be trained in that way, you need to look around and perhaps perhaps get some, some fresh blood in that, that can really help you with, with the data management elements. And also to make sure that you are choosing the right tools, because as I said, the vendor selection process is, is, is an absolute minefield at the moment. Uh, and you need to have those people sort of within your department who can ask the right questions when you're selecting the tool tools. Thank you, Victoria. I'll move on to what perhaps for many people is going to be the headline of this survey, and that's the average annual cost of AML compliance operations. Uh, now, when I saw this number, um, 41 million euros and so, and so I, I was initially surprised by its size, but then I considered um, actually the definition uh, of anti-money laundering in the survey methodology is quite broad. So it included um, initial onboarding, know your customer work, um, client and transaction screening, uh, transaction um, profiling, uh, all the remediation, enhanced due diligence and investigation work, and so on. So it's, it's quite a broad range of activities. And um, AML often means um, different things to many people. For this survey, we, we took a, a broad approach. Um, I also thought it was um, notable that no respondents expected AML costs to decrease next year, and perhaps the only mild surprise was that um, it, it was a really 100% of respondents who thought that way. Now, this slide looks at the relative costs of AML compliance for different sizes of financial institutions. Um, no real surprise, perhaps, that AML co compliance costs hit smaller firms harder. Um, I think this is significant given the relative challenge um, some smaller financial institutions have uh, in staffing um, compliance departments um, it, with, in some cases, more than one person. Um, they may lack the in-depth um, AML skills and experience and capabilities uh, that are found in a larger institution. Uh, Victoria, um, you've mentioned um, your experience of smaller institutions in Switzerland, but perhaps more generally, do you think it, uh, it's more difficult for smaller financial institutions to, to sustain a, um, an effective um, a AML operation? Um, I don't know if it's if it's always more difficult, but there are definitely a, a set of specific challenges that the smaller departments have to face. Um, you know, obviously, there are the departmental overheads and the technology costs that just don't scale down in a proportional way. So you, you're going to get a proportionately a higher cost for the for the management and the technology that you're using. I think probably the the biggest driver of that though is compliance is such a multidisciplinary operation. An AML department, for example, needs to have technical, investigative, legal, operational skills to cover the, all the kinds of issues that they come across. And, and to really get all those skills into a small team, well, you have to be very lucky with the individuals you employ or be very smart with the way you train them. And, and that's not always possible depending on the, the market that you're operating in. So I think, think that's a, a key aspect. And perhaps a, a supporting aspect, if you like, is possibly the lack of networking support that AML professionals sometimes feel in the small, smaller organizations. Because when you've got to the, the larger banks as members of things like the Wolfsburg Group, there's an enormous amount of professional support available within that network that compliance professionals that are leading smaller AML operations just don't manage to tap into. So, so yes, I do think smaller organizations but they have challenges. If they're not greater challenges, then there's certainly a different set of challenges that they have to overcome. Thank you. Next, we have a slide that 
aims to capture the average time taken to clear an alert um, at different stages of the compliance operation. Um, this is uh, a fairly familiar slide, and it's often used to put a cost to the hours um, so that compliance can be priced um, and, and to also understand the value of what is effective and what isn't. In my opinion, these results, um, I think, show the opportunity to use data and technology more effectively, um, notably by breaking down um, intelligence data silos within an institution. I thought the quote on this page was very interesting um, in that there was a complaint that the compliance department lacked that unique view of uh, a customer uh, from all the different sources um, within that financial institution. I've found it that it's a common problem that compliance departments don't have access to data um, that um, has important facets of an information, or oh, sorry, important facets of a relationship uh, stored in another line of business or in another geography. And we, we see greater demand um, to break down these silos and to pull all this information together so that all these all the different facets of risk can be combined um, to create something that's more valuable than than the cost of its individual pieces and that true insight is, is um, something which when it's deployed correctly uh, can lead to quicker decisioning uh, and more effective decisioning uh, by making the right uh, answers in the context of the information that's available. Now, this, uh, this looks at the impact on business productivity. Um, I was um, quite heartened that 25% of respondents saw AML compliance processes as having a positive impact on the line of business. Now, I think a couple of years ago, we wouldn't have seen such a relatively high score. I think um, we, we would have seen um, the negative uh, options perhaps polling higher. And I think what this means is that there's a greater understanding, firstly, of the um, business benefits of compliance within the compliance department itself, but also across an organization. Uh, and that AML is seen in the broader context of uh, the risk controls that are in place to make uh, a bank stable and profitable. I also think it's um, due in part to uh, the more effective use of tools to produce greater intelligence uh, on the profile and behavior of banking clients. Uh, still, we see 71% um, who regard AML compliance uh, as having a moderately negative effect, and it's within that 71% that perhaps the biggest gains uh, can be made. The quote um, on this screen about uh, liquidity I thought was also interesting, um, that the negative uh, effect of not being able to onboard a customer or to approve a deal, we don't often see that priced into the overall cost of compliance. And that opportunity cost is something uh, which I think is being recognized more widely today. Now, this is um, the last graph we have today, and it concerns the job satisfaction within compliance departments. So this is all about human capital. And um, I think that many of you will, will recognize some of the sentiment um, expressed in the quote about um, there being a low level of work satisfaction, um, about fear perhaps of being outsourced. Um, and it did, overall, uh, it, it doesn't really seem that compliance people are, are happy in their roles. Now, there are, there are a number of reasons for that. Um, increase in personal liability perhaps being one of them, greater workload and um, greater operational pressure um, being um, negative drivers towards this. So as we see costs increasing and operational workload increasing, um, this leads to more pressure and it's harder to hit KPOs. 
um, perhaps there's a temptation to mo to move into a better paid job, either with a larger institution perhaps or or into the consulting sector. We see technology um, being um, approached as perhaps um, a, a solution to uh, these productivity problems. Um, but it's important to remember that um, technology in itself isn't a panacea for, for um, everything that's wrong. And that there, there needs to be a recognition that human capital uh, it needs investment too. Victoria, uh, in your opinion, what makes a more productive environment within a compliance department? Um, I think I think there's uh, several factors, and some of them we've we've touched on earlier in this discussion. Um, firstly, the support of effective technology tools for collating and organizing information can make a huge difference to job satisfaction as compared to having to go to multiple different data sources and copy and paste pieces into Excel spreadsheets and Word documents. Uh, that's a, it's a very sort of administrative data collection task. It, it doesn't really have a close connection to the, to the risks that we're all trying to work against here. And uh, hopefully innovations in compliance intelligence management will help to address that. And a, and a related thing, I think, that impacts it, um, when we have that kind of automation of the, the more repetitive tasks, this should follow a, an upskilling of the compliance function, if you like, um, that will also impact on morale as well. Um, I think in the past, with regulatory requirements increasing the need to look at information from lots of different sources, the immediate response was to increase headcounts. Um, so you've got a, a large compliance department all sort of trying to push data together and compare it and, and put together information to do the investigations and clear alerts. That development effectively downskilled the compliance work, which obviously had its impact on job satisfaction. So automating the lower level tasks will enable the departments to get staff more connected to the social responsibilities that I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation and providing them with the, the skills and training that they need in order to contribute to those social responsibilities. I think that's going to make for a more engaged and, and you know, motivated compliance function moving forward. Thank you, Victoria. So in summary, um, let's look at some of the takeaways from the report. Now, the first perhaps isn't news as such, um, but it is a reality. The fourth directive is putting more pressure on financial institutions, compliance departments, and there's more screening involved, um, and there's greater operational strain. Now, what the report does, um, I hope, is help to direct um, the reader to means of approaching a response to this reality in a way that leads to um, a sustainable process and also improved business benefits. Secondly, the need to improve uh, client onboarding um, in a way that reduces customer friction whilst maintaining um, the higher standards of um, regulatory compliance and regulatory expectation is becoming ever more important. Um, there's a lot of business pressure uh, for uh, more insightful information uh, which can be collected at this point of the customer relationship and we also see more compliance drivers for um, asking more questions. Perhaps they're related to tax compliance uh, or anti-bribery. Um, there are a number of different reasons why um, compliance type questions are being asked of customers. And there's a, a need to educate customers um, on why they're being asked uh, all of these questions um, and to give them a, a sense that actually once you can help us verify um, the, your, your status in perhaps for a ID verification or whatever it might be, that we, then we can go about um, developing the, um, the best products and relationships and best prices for you. And lastly, the um, levering technology um, and data across um, lines of business, products, and geographies. Uh, we hear so often that uh, there are internal barriers to information sharing. Now, in, in the experience of, of, I've had with uh, institutions uh, in different places around the world, the, the, 
it may take some work, but normally the internal barriers to sharing information can be navigated. Um, the legal or the data protection or privacy concerns uh, can be managed appropriately. And once all that information um, is put together um, using um, analytics and various data mining techniques, one can pro pro provide a much richer view of a customer that takes all of those facets of a relationship from different departments and from different um, areas of a financial institution in order to create something which is uh, much more valuable and much more insightful in terms of um, business development, but also compliance risk management. Good. So we have some time for questions, and thank you um, to those of you who have submitted your comments already. Um, Victoria, the, the first one we have, which I'll ask you to to um, respond to, uh, as I think you touched on it earlier, is that um, some banks outsource the compliance function. Um, is that the right process um, that banks are are, are executing on? the outsourcing of compliance operations. Victoria, are you on mute? I'm so sorry. Uh, I think it's definitely not the right thing to um, to outsource the, the entire compliance function. But um, as I mentioned throughout the discussion, there are some very low level tasks uh, and technology operations that, that can be outsourced provided you keep a really tight control on, on on what exactly you've outsourced and really make sure that the outsourced function is performing the way you think it is because I go into so many banks and you know they've, they've come across a problem with a monitor or a regulator whatever and it's because there's a part of the business either internally or externally that just isn't focusing the way that the people who were strategically responsible for the compliance function thought it was. So actually, whether it's internal or external, so long as the people who actually have the responsibility for that compliance actually really do you know, have a good grip and know exactly what it's doing and where, if any, 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 you know, any downsides are, and they've actually strategically accepted those, then I think it's fine. What, what isn't fine is when you assume, as I said, you know, like the example I gave with the, the screening and the name recognition, if you've outsourced it particularly happens when you've outsourced the global alerts to maybe a little place in a, in a small part of Asia where the, the people that you are hire, the hiring being hired in the outsource center actually just aren't familiar with names from other parts of the world, then that's going to cause you an issue because they aren't going to really notice what, you know, what is a matching name and what isn't. So you really just need to know what have you outsourced and take responsibility for making sure it works the way that you think it's working. Thank you, Victoria. My personal experience of outsourcing is that um, there was a, a, a lack of understanding of how much uh, management expertise needed to be retained um, at the center in order to manage outsource operations. Um, now, when that wasn't recognized, um, it l led to um, higher costs and uh, greater delays until that problem was rectified. But by then, of course, um, it was difficult to um, reskill with that human capital because people had moved on. So it, it does um, require careful planning. And uh, I, I think, Victoria, as you've suggested, uh, understanding the capability um, of the vendor and also its expectations of the relationship are critical. Next question. Uh, again, Victoria, another technology-related question, and I will quote, since humans are still designing and programming automated software, isn't it a false reassurance that the accuracy will be guaranteed? Absolutely. Um, and that is, is really you know, is another way of, of what I was trying to get at when I said that you know, the quality of these, these external offerings is, is very variable. Um, it's definitely not guaranteed and anyone who is actually purchasing software and it's not cheap software that is used in these functions really must take the 
responsibility to test that and to know exactly what it's doing and to spot those mistakes in the way that the tool works before they've actually committed to a contract that, that signs them up to using this tool for an extended period where they actually then have to work with the vendor and effectively help the vendor develop their products. So in short, absolutely, yes, there are a lot of products out there that, that really don't do what they claim to do, not necessarily because the vendors are trying to swiz you, but just because the vendors actually haven't got a good enough grasp of, of how the bank is going to use that product. So, so yes, it, test, I, I just can't say that enough times. Yes, I agree. The the investment in making sure the technology is the right piece for the institution's risk profile and need is is so important. Um, when I started in on the on this side of compliance, um, regulators would go in to visit customers, and the question they would ask is, "No, do you have a system?" And it was either a yes or no answer. And if the answer was yes, the the, the question was answered. Um, but today, that, that regulator is, of course, asking, well, what do you have? Why did you choose that? How did you test it? How did you configure it? And so on and so on. So the, the regulatory knowledge um, of how technology works uh, has changed. And also um, the expectation on how financial institutions are deploying that technology and maintaining that technology in the face of um, evolving risks ha has also moved on tremendously. Victoria, um, a Brexit question, and sorry for putting you first again, uh, but what are the compliance um, impacts of Brexit for European compliance departments? Uh, well, I think overall the impacts of Brexit are still a fairly uh, unknown quantity. Um, and I think that's where the cost drivers are with, with Brexit at the moment, is, is it's just the uncertainty because um, any programs that you want to put in place, any changes to technology or rules or anything like that, um, you need to think ahead. And you're really not sure you know, which direction we're going, um, what kind of relationships are going to be uh, created, what the responsibilities will be. Presumably, since we're all still working supposedly towards the same aim, which is you know, to reduce the laundering of money from criminal and terrorist activities, um, presumably, we will still broadly want to go in the same direction. But in terms of the regulatory ob obligations, it's really very unknown at the moment. And that's where the extra, extra costs are going to come, is in, in where the banks sort of have to hedge their bets in terms of what they're planning going forward. Thank you, Victoria. Yes, from, from my perspective, um, I think that more and more European uh, institutions, uh, meaning institutions in the EU 27, are going to have to create new processes um, for dealing with UK business. And uh, as they do today when dealing with Switzerland, for example, um, the, the, the real um, change, I think, would come should the UK diverge significantly from um, EU data protection or money laundering um, requirements. And at, at that point, then, it, it might be more difficult um, to, to use the same or a similar approach for um, business in the UK or on the mainland. Another question. Um, is it better to reduce AML, CFT compliance costs by investing in more technology or in human resource. Now, from, from my perspective, there's, there's not one single answer here because um, you would need to understand the, the context of um, the question, meaning what is the profile of the financial institution, what sort of business are they operating, uh, where are they operating, what sort of products, and what's the value of those products. Um, it's still my opinion that whilst um, we are seeing more automation in compliance, that the, the discipline is still a blend of science and art. And if, if there's too much emphasis on um, one of those sides uh, over the other, then the correct balance isn't going to be struck. So uh, I, I would say that the, the right balance can only be determined 
by um, understanding um, the risk profile of an institution, meaning there's going to be a, a full and thorough um, risk audit. And after that, um, the, the, the best compliance response can be mapped out. Victoria, what do you think? Uh, well, I would agree. I, I think the you know you don't want to start necessarily that question with with looking at you know should I in, invest in technology or in, or in people because um, I think the the answer is inevitably going to be both. But um, but where you want to start is you know what are the challenges I've got now? What are my strengths and my weaknesses? And how can I close that gap? And in, in clo trying to close that gap, is technology going to be more helpful or is, are our people going to be more helpful? And it's probably a combination of the both. But, but you know, an organization that's already got very strong um, you know, machine learning and what have you built into its technology is probably going to need to invest more in its people to get them to be skilled enough to work with that, that technology as opposed to an organization that's got very outdated systems but a lot of very experienced compliance staff who probably want to invest more in the technology and then additionally train their staff to the new procedures. So I, I really do think that, that that question needs to start with an, an assessment of the status quo and a gap analysis in terms of where you want to be. Thank you. We have a question about um, people. And it is, from a hiring perspective, do you see an increased investment in growing compliance teams? What skill sets are going to be crucial with upcoming regulatory changes and at what levels? Um, I'll start with this one. Um, speaking um, with a sort of, um, uh, with a, looking at a long view of this, I think, yes, there has been more compliance investment um, in people over the years. Uh, a few years ago, for example, I think compliance was very often, uh, not always, but very often, the departments in which you might have ended up by accident. It, it wasn't um, seen as an attractive place to work. But today, um, you can do internships in compliance, you can do uh, master's degrees in compliance. Um, the position is better paid, uh, it's a lot more visible, and um, the, the head of compliance is often reporting directly to the board. So I, I think that um, there's also a greater appreciation of the, the professional discipline um, amongst uh, peers in banking. So yes, we have seen more investment in that. What more could be done? I, I think uh, I would recommend um, more immersion in some of the newer um, technologies uh, but also looking at some of um, the, the, the nuts and bolts self-compliance operations, particularly with regards to name matching and understanding um, how uh, the filters work in order to provide the results. Victoria. Um, well, obviously, I'm going to echo uh, the idea that you know name matching is is a key. Place where investment can take place going forward because that's where I spend most of my my working life. Um, I think in terms of the the skills and investment that needs to happen going forward, and it's it is both in the in the technology and also in the compliance skills. And those compliance skills are going to be changing, as I said, because a lot of the lower level jobs are hopefully going to be automated and taken over by that technology. And we're going to need more skilled staff who are more able to critically analyze the information that they're being presented with and make decisions based on that um, and, and less of the sort of information crunching and box ticking staff that we perhaps needed say five years ago. Thanks Victoria. There's a similar question that's just arrived that um, is when companies start investing more in technology doesn't that take away job opportunities? Uh, my response is that um, one should perhaps look at um, the introduction of technology as an opportunity to learn more skills and to become more effective in a role. Um, that those are uh, very transfer transferable skills. Um, at the at the lower end of the productivity scale, then perhaps yes, some of those um, jobs will be replaced by machines. But um, there, there are always going to be um, there's always going to be human oversight needed. 
Yes, I, I think I would agree with that. I mean, technology hopefully will take away job opportunities to do boring number crunching work and and drive it more towards the decision making uh, work that, that people can really, really get involved in. Um, and I think always, you know, increasing the skill level of work, people will rise to that challenge and will enjoy that work more. Um, perhaps we need less staff um, within a certain function of the organization, but we'll need more to actually to understand and to tune the, the technology and to to plan for it to be fitted with into, into the processes and make sure it's working. There are so many more job opportunities that can be created in terms of you know, assessing what the technology is that's out there and seeing how it can be leveraged within the organization. I don't really think that we should shed too many tears over the loss of, of some more, you know, the, the more number crunching jobs that were responsible for the perhaps lowering of morale over the last few years. Yes, agreed. Uh, change of um, subject now, and this perhaps is the, the, the last or, or the penultimate question, and it is, would the industry benefit from more utility models for KYC or investigations to drive costs down? Um, my answer to that is yes, uh, and um, th th this is very much a, a matter of interest for me. Uh, w we do see utility models um, gaining significant traction in some places um, around the world. Um, the advantages for the participants within these contributory systems are indeed lower costs, but also everyone benefits from um, other members' data. So um, the, the insight, um, the range of information that can be shared uh, across a group whilst maintaining um, competitive and confidentiality concerns, um, that, is, that has tremendous potential uh, for more effective compliance and um, um, and uh, better risk management, uh, more informed risk management. Um, cost, uh, yes, potentially it could drive down cost, particularly in terms of um, IT infrastructure. These things are, are normally service-based uh, and managed by a third party. So there are uh, advantages there, particularly for smaller institutions. Uh, I still see some um, um, reticence in some places in the world for information sharing. Um, that is the question of sort of the concept of utility itself is, is sometimes questioned as uh, is it viable or not um, given data protection or privacy concerns. But more and more we're seeing um, utilities being established to uh, address the compliance or risk concerns of um, specific communities. Um, and I think we're going to see more of those, um, particularly as uh, more regulators become familiar with the concepts uh, and also um, as regulators understand the benefits that they can deliver. Victoria. Yes, I, I think definitely that you know, the industry is going to go in a, in a utility model um, direction. Again, echoing what I've said before, I think what's really, really crucial is that the people who have responsibility for risk management within an organization maintain absolute control and understanding over what's going on in those utilities. So the quality is going to be, is going to be vital. And, and it's, um, it's a very fashionable area for various uh, technology vendors and consulting firms to go into at the moment. So, oh, we can do some KYC utility here. Um, and I don't know that they've always got the, the experience to do that. So uh, some of them do, obviously. So it's, it's very, very important that you, you select those, those very carefully and that you retain control and you know what, what they are doing. Because if they're providing a perfect service to you, but it's not exactly what you think they're doing, then there's going to be a gap there and you can leave some risks within your organization. So yes, I think that is the way forward, provided it's controlled and understood by the people who've got the responsibility for those functions. Um, but you do have to select very carefully, I think. Uh, once you've done that, I think the benefits for, for cost reduction and also for information sharing, which uh, is very is very key topic you know, at the moment in terms of driving down financial crime risk globally, is sharing information both within the private sector and within the public private sector. Uh, cooperation. So yes, definitely that's the way to go. But I, I don't want people to sort of rush down that alley 
um, without being aware of, of the risks that can be involved if you, if you lose control of the, what's being provided to your organization. Thanks, Victoria. Caveat temptor as ever. Uh, that is the end of our session today. Um, thank you very much for your participation. Uh, Victoria and I can be contacted directly should you wish to discuss any points in further detail. Uh, please, do leave, please do leave your feedback. It really helps ACAMS um, and us to define relevant and practical programs. Um, Nicole, over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Crystal and Victoria. I would also like to thank our sponsor, LexisNexis Risk Solutions, and you, the audience, for your questions today. As Crystal mentioned, we do appreciate your feedback, so please take a moment to complete the survey in the Attachments tab, where you can also download the PDF presentation. There is additional information on the PDF regarding ACAMP's advanced certification, certificates, and risk assessment. This conclu concludes today's event. Thank you, and goodbye.